that feel the need to protect themselves by carrying a knife or carrying a <coughs> weapon. And we need to recognize that the young people themselves are frightened. Young people themselves are feeling that they've been let down. So we mustn't just look at the victims, we must also look at the potential victims who are young people who are trying to go about their lives. And that's our responsibility. It's a stain on society that we have young people that feel that they have to protect themselves in this way. And what we saw in Edmonton just a, a few weeks ago, I think really brought it home to us. I was um, fortunate enough to sit down with the police and the stakeholders to find out what actually happened on the 17th and the 18th of November. Because what we saw as a community were two very, very serious incidents which were interconnected. And they weren't random acts, but any one of us could have got hurt whilst this, these incidents were taking place. And I don't know if the police have spoken to the community about what happened on the 17th and the 18th of November. But what I was told was that they were interconnected. And unfortunately, um, the young person that the gang was trying to get was in both of the incidents. So I don't know how much you know, and I'm obviously I'm very happy to talk to you more about that. But what I want you to know is that the police have taken it a lot more seriously than I thought they would have, because they had the meeting and they explained that they knew some of the individuals because they had already been identified as young people that potentially could be caught up in violence. But that's still not good enough for us because we could have been walking past that. We could have been going to the shop, we could have got hurt. And that is why it's important that we come together and we say enough is enough. That is why we come together and we say, why are you not talking to us? How can we help prevent this happening? Because as we all know, and as, and as we all felt at the time, it was traumatic, it was scary. We were watching it on TV whilst it was happening because they were interconnected and they were happening quite quickly. So I think what we need to remember that violence is being conducted by a very small number of people. Amongst them, of course, are young people, but this is also interconnected with drugs, with the spate of prostitution that we're seeing along 4th Street, because organised crime doesn't just happen in isolation. There's lots of other things which we are experiencing in Edmonton, and I think we need to start recognising that. What we're seeing in Edmonton is not just because there's one group of people who are thinking they can take advantage of us. <coughs> there are lots of people who feel that it's easy, we're open, and we're allowing that to happen. And that's why us coming together in this room and us talking and making sure our voices are heard and showing that we, we, this is not acceptable. Edmonton is not a place where gangs can come and just do whatever they want to do. Because we live here. There's many of us that can't go nowhere else. And this is our home, and we want to be proud of our home. And it's important that everyone recognises that. This is not a dumping ground for, for people to, to just take advantage of us. But what we need to be saying to young people is that if you carry a weapon, you are more likely to be hurt by that weapon. Carrying a weapon is not a way of protection. Carrying a weapon could potentially mean you lose your life. And that is the message we need to get out to young people, first and foremost. But as we know, young people feel vulnerable, they feel threatened by other young people, they also feel threatened by the police as well. They feel the police are not there to protect them on a day-to-day -day basis. If anything, they feel the police are there to blame them for the violence that's taking place in the area that they live in. And we're talking about young people of the age of 15, 14. I mean, at that age, you should be carefree. At that age, you should be free to walk down the street. You should be able to leave your bike outside a shop without being accused of stealing the bike. And in the new year, I want to have a conference myself where everyone comes together. We start talking together. And we, we have our own plan, our own plan for Edmonton, of what it should look like. 
and anyone that wants to come in here, whether they want to give us funding, whether they want to work with us, we tell them this is what we want here. They don't need to turn, turn up and tell us what we need. We live here, we know what's going on. And I just want you all to be part of this and let's work together because I think we can make a difference but we just need to show other people that we're proud of where we live and that we have our own standards and at this point in time they need to be better. So thank you so much. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kate Osomo and Osomo. So thank you very much for uh, facing those issues. And I think he, this is an opportunity for us to put the question, is anybody in the question at our local MP, uh, you know, um, that you may have before we go to, we go to our uh, group discussion. The year in 2008, three were stabbed and one was bricked in the head um, and died two weeks later. Uh, I was 16 years of age and this happened in Edmonton along 4th Street in Bounces Road. And if it wasn't for my mum actually throwing me into sort of personal development and I sort of um, had a youth worker at Craig's Park who I used to dance with, um, I don't know if I would have ended up in prison or dead myself. And that was my life. And I set up my own company um, once I did a degree in youth and community work uh, six years ago. Uh, and that is there to help inspire and save young lives through enterprise. So we um, run programs for both early years and young people, um, and it, it, it's been working, but most of my work has actually been more valued in southwest and southeast London, where young people have access to free inter enterprise, employment, and training um, up to the ages of 30. And what's nice about that is a lot of young people, I mean even people that I know very personally and very closely, once they have lost their job at the age of 29, decided to go back onto country lines. And now when you're above 25 and you don't have a very good employment um, experience and you go back into the streets or the gang crime, your role at that age is more of an influencer and more controlling as opposed to being the young person to be on the missing list and running to a country to come back to Edmonton, if that makes sense. So once I, and, and my question to myself was, what else can I do with this, this person that I know? I helped them get two jobs, both were part-time, both were um, only for a short period of time. So once those had finished, um, this person went back to country lines and this person has three children where, you know, I'm 27, I have a young son myself, he's five years old. Um, and, you know, I went and I did a crowdfund last year uh, for, for 30 days and um, I wanted to raise two and a half thousand pounds. I did it, um, but it wasn't by the help of Enfield, actually. I, I, I wrote a letter, I, I spoke to different organisations, but it wasn't by the help of, of Enfield. In fact, my work, as I said, has been respected in East, South East and South West um, London. And I suppose, um, you know, when I actually, I, my mum, she ended up selling her house in Edmonton. I lived just here, Shrubbery Road, since I was three years old, which is where this building is. Um, when she sold her house, I ended up having to move out. And I um, um, now live in Bushall Park, but until I could evidence that I had work all the way in South East, they were happy to move me all the way um, to uh, Hull or wherever, wherever it is outside of London. And uh, both, uh, my, my nan has been here since she was 16. I have all my first cousins that live in Edmonton or Bushall Park. This is where my heart is, is what is not being listened to, really. Um, we need to look at how we prevent crime. Um, we need to be supporting those who experience it. And like you said, it's not just the person who's lost their life or has been injured. It's their friends. It's the family. It's how do you feel? after that and no one's really asking you how you feel and what can happen what could happen next because that's another thing is that once it happens there is going to be a reprisal and that needs to be intervened before it takes place but we can sit here and talk about you know lack of funds we can sit here but you've just said it with a small amount of money people are making a difference but you need to have minds around those people that have got a little bit of money to say look this small amount of money can stretch this far if it's given to the right person but it's not being given always to the right person. Sometimes it is, <laughs> but a lot of the times, those people who don't want a lot of money, are not looking for fame, not looking for anything other than just making a difference 
to prevent one more person either losing their life or feeling they need to carry a knife. Because what we're seeing, especially <coughs> in the way society looks at young people, just generally, they're disregarded. Whether it comes down to even the age of voting, you can't vote until you're of a certain age. But those people who vote on your behalf don't walk, don't walk on your path, don't even understand what you go through. So the way young people are treated in society is that they are not listened to. That needs to change. We need to make sure that we have a curriculum that is fit for purpose, that teaches you what life could be like when you get older. Instead, it talks about old history, which is important. Not just, <laughs> we need to know our history to know where we're going. But we need to be in tune with those people that need to make a difference for our future. So if young people are being disregarded and being discounted, what will happen? We will lose a generation. And this is, this is crucial. We're going to lose because the way that we look at conflict in other countries is the way we should look at conflict here. But we're not. We're thinking that because we have education, most of us can maybe get a job, you know, there's a house for you, that you're not living in a war zone. But we are living in a war zone and we need to respond accordingly. So I mean, I'd love to speak to you, you know, outside of this. Um, obviously, I don't have no funding, I don't have no money, but... I have influence in the way that we start talking to young people and I think we need to make sure young people are part of that conversation and that's something which I think is not, I've not said, but the next step forward has to be informed by what young people need. Yeah. Thank you. A lot of them, they will go for interview, they will be successful during the interview, but as soon as they put um, in the case that maybe they are on medication, and um, yeah, so they will just tell them off that, okay, we cannot um, employ you because um, you got um, a mental health issue. Um, I've got um, an evidence for this thing, the very thing that I'm, that I'm saying here. So, so it's like a lot of them, um, they are going through a lot of frustration. So there's a lot of them out there. Um, instead of them to um, actually go into the community, maybe to get socialized with other people, they find it so difficult. If you, there, there is no amount of motivation that uh, maybe um, you might be trying to even give to them or encouragement for them to even go to all this lecture center, but instead they will just keep to themselves. So then I now decided to, okay, what can I actually do to actually maybe to to, to make the community to be more inclusive. So then I said, okay. Um, then um, it came to mind that, okay, that um, I should carry out a project. And I said to patients that her idea sounds really, really helpful, especially for those people who have been stigmatized because of their health issues. Um, I think the council really does need to um, maybe sit down with you and see what options are on the table. But you did mention that the property department has responded, so it's difficult for me to sort of respond out of that until I've seen the, the letter. So maybe if you send that to the office, Owen's here from my office, so maybe you could send a copy of it and then we could look at it and then make representation for you. Age starts from year six, year five, in primary school, obviously. And the numbers throughout England is high, obviously, through Glasgow, it's about three, four percent of the grooming mm. on it. And throughout Sheffield, Bradford, same number. Yes. But now in London, especially in Enfield, Harringay, Northwest London, South London, the grooming has started picking up a lot. Mm. So what are you guys are doing to prevent that? Especially in within the community, not just the community, in the schools, especially the primary schools. Because now you start seeing a lot of the primary schools are getting schools of young kids. Mm. Don't you think we should prevent that early and getting involved? That's my question there. Without a shadow, I used to be a governor at a school in Tottenham before I became an MMP. I was in Ferry Lane. I'm sure you guys know where Ferry Lane yeah. is. And we had a lot of young kids there whose older brothers, when I say older brothers, I'm just talking about a brother that's 12 years old. <laughs> um, and we had one young boy that ran out of the school because he thought that something was going to happen to his older brother and he escaped from the school and he was seven. And, you know, he was vulnerable on so many different levels and vulnerable to, be, to end up in a gang himself. So what we did, we intervened as a school. We didn't wait for the council to get involved. We didn't wait for the government or the MP 
But as a governor, what I did is I approached the family and I spoke to the mum. And then I found out what was happening at home. And unfortunately, it was very complex. It wasn't straightforward. And a lot of it was around her own mental health and stress that she was going through because she, she was witnessing it herself. She could see what was happening. No one needed to tell her that her children were not acting as children. They were acting as adults. They had far too much money. They were able to buy clothes for themselves. And the mother did not have enough money herself. So what we had to do as a school is we need to have a wider conversation, not just to isolate the mother, to try to just speak to the mum alone, was to talk to all of, the, all of the children. And for us to do that, we had an assembly. So I'm just telling you what I did and how now as an MP, I need to take all of that experience and make sure that as a council, as a borough, or as, as local leaders, we're having those open conversations. Because what, what we're good at doing is isolating families and stigmatizing families, similar to what Patience was talking about. And the impact that has on individual families is that your health will deteriorate because you'll blame yourself. So is we had a open assembly with the school and then slowly we asked different teachers to identify in their classrooms children that didn't have didn't used to come into school hungry. So then what we did is we had a breakfast club. And all we had was cornflakes and milk and some toast. And nobody paid for that. So the school took responsibility. Because again, if you say you paid for breakfast, but you can't afford breakfast, so your child can't have it, then we're separating kids. And the reason I'm speaking in this way is that we have to be holistic, mm -hmm. not aggressive in the way we respond, if we can be. Sometimes we have to intervene quickly and scoop a child out because nobody can help the family and no one can help the child. One minute, sir. But if we're holistic in the way that we respond, we're able to help more families. Because sometimes you can't help one family, but you can, might be able to help 20 other families because they're seeing what you're doing and then they feel comfortable to start telling you things. Because the way that we inform each other is by being open, like we're doing now. But a mother has to feel safe in the school, that she can talk about what's happening at home without the teacher calling in social services to say, all right, we're taking the child away, it's over. And it's so delicate because you can pull on one thread and everything collapses. Or you can build up a family, they feel strong, and then they tell you about all the other families to say, my neighbour's going through the same thing and this has happened and I'm a success case and you've helped me. Because you've helped me, I can bring more people in. Because we, it, it is epidemic. Levels of poverty and how that's affecting our communities is sky high. A UN, you, you did, I don't know if you heard, I'm sure you know. Yeah, of course, you're, you're, you're well read, you're well read, yeah, I know you're well read. Yes. And I'm also chair of governors at a special school in Enfield. So I know about schools and I know about education and I know that schools are very underfunded. A lot of the work that we do with pupils, um, we have had TAs, we've had learning mentors, We've had um, lots of cuts, and very often the cuts that happen go to things like after-school clubs or um, learning mentors or te teaching assistants or, you know, the extras are going because there isn't the funding to support it. The work that those people do is crucial in building relationships with young people. It's crucial because they can meet and greet, they can encourage, they can help them with their breakfast at breakfast time, they help them at lunch time with their social interaction, they help them to communicate, they help them to learn. And all of that is not, it's not nothing, it's very important and it helps children to feel part of their schools. And when I'm standing here and I'm saying we are underfunded, we are not able to provide the level of support that we would like for every child, let alone SEN children. How can we, you know, change everything to address this one issue? We have so many issues in education. And I'm not denying that this is an important issue. And I'm saying to you, schools are doing their utmost. We are trying really, really hard to address the issues that you know, surround our young people. We work 
to protect our children and keep them safe in school. We work to educate them, we work to give them opportunities and we work to give them choices and we try and teach them values like respect and how to look after each other, how to make friends. It's not, there's no easy solution, and, but I'm saying to you, we are part of the issue, but we're also part of the solution. But we need, it, we need to be funded properly. Uh, Mr. Mitton, underscoring the amazing work the primary or all our schools are doing. But I know, on my experience, uh, I'm working with the schools, the Somali community, if I take as, as an example, it's one of the largest in the Bara. And I hardly saw um, any school that have, you know, uh, that has a Somali speaking staff or liaison officers in house. And this creates misunderstanding. A mother or fathers who don't communicate properly, uh, who cannot help with the, the, the kids at home. And the kids, uh, you know, slip through the through the net, you know. But I'm aware, you know, the schools are failing to address this need of the community. Obviously, the Somali community. I had one of the council officials saying, in this borough, those who make the largest noise get the most. But I know the Somali community don't make that much noise, you know. And obviously. I would like to see the school is uh, looking inward and looking there, you know, parents and, 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 and pupils and students and addressing their needs. Thank you. Can I just respond to that and say that we used to provide lots of translation services for people who didn't speak English very well and that budget was cut and I'm mm. sorry but how can you communicate well if you haven't got any budget to cover that. And that's not that we, we didn't want that. We were happy to provide it when we could. But if you have no budget for it, you can't provide. So it, a lot comes down to what you can do with the money that you've got. Okay? So if they want us to communicate properly, they need to help us. We're not trying to deny that there's a need. We, w we would dearly like to be able to meet everybody's need. But if you're financially strapped every direction you look in, you're not going to be able to do it. We're on our knees. Around the fear that these young people face and about the importance of an open communication with your child so they're able to tell you what they're going through and the importance of creating a safe network around your child, so knowing what your child is doing in the community, speaking to your friends and family and people within the community and asking them, you know, because I've been in so many houses and parents are gen genuinely unaware of how their child presents within the community. Mm. Understanding that above these children is another layer of people who are possibly exploiting your children, they might not necessarily see it as a choice, what they go through. Um, the importance of intelligence, uh, of sharing that intelligence. If you hear or see something within the community, even if you don't feel comfortable to go to the police, calling crime stoppers. You were talking about the chicken shop and exploitation. Exploitation that's hidden. It doesn't look like sometimes anything more than children misbehaving or messing about, but really there's something much deeper and it becomes very difficult to prove that if people aren't willing to tell us what, what's going on. So I think it's around also not relying on the system to kind of be the only thing that helps your children. So it's searching your children's rooms, knowing what's going on on social media, understanding your child better than anybody because relying on anyone else to come and save your child isn't the way forward. Yes, there is a system in place that can help you, but ultimately it is about the community and what you can do to keep the children safe. So I would say like intelligence is really important. Um, and I would say knowing what's going on with your child and sharing that. And if you have that evidence, being willing to be resilient enough to say, this is what I have, I need help, and to keep going, and to go to the right people to get that to happen. Um, and
and understanding that your children could be very afraid and there is a real consequence for them if they do say what's happening to them. And I don't think we even have any idea the consequences of what children face, the level of violence, the things that they've seen, the pressures, the humiliation, you know, children are beaten up and it's posted on Snapchat and then they feel like they can't go to school, they feel embarrassed, they then feel a fear and they feel like they need to join in. It's such a complex issue um, and throughout all of this children are often vilified and what we need to ensure that we're doing is really listening to them and understanding what they're going through and if we as if you as parents and the community if you don't believe in them and support them they're going to find that really really difficult because they're going to feel like they're not heard and there's nothing worse for a child than not being seen or heard and if you empower them to feel seen and heard their outcomes are a lot more likely to be successful and the ones that you want. So like from my experience and what I've done, they would be like my key points which are relevant to you in this forum. So I think that helps. Why the police who are responsible for knife crime and drugs supported the youth and prevented the crime door to door and streets before having to kill someone who wished to live a long life. Please, we need the police to help young and youth and our children, especially young boys. Why? Because Katie will request you to talk to police to help on the streets. Mm -hmm. They come after what happened, you know, after when the children or young people kill. And they come always when someone died. Mm -hmm. I call police one time, I see a crime, and I talk on the street because I'm on that way, something happening. And they say, it's okay, you have to leave, you can't stay. It's my friend, someone robbed in the cash machine. And we called the police and we went in long time. After then, we left it, the, the state. Because this country, we do not feel safe. Really, we're not safe. And our children is not safe. Please and please, we need to talk to police regularly and come on the streets. Because in Austin, children die every day. My friend, son, he is on the street and some misunderstanding to kill without reason. And he think another one who fighting or who has a crime together. Because young boys die innocently, without selling drugs, without TVs, without any crime. Please and please, Katie, you are my MB. And I am talking my children and my young sons. Please, we need to talk this meeting regularly until we save a young boy who died and who wishing to live longer. Because we are mothers, we are innocent, we cry every day. Every day really we cry. And especially Somali community, they waiting the next door who's dying next time. Every day we die innocent, young boys, especially boys. Please and please, community not to sleep. Not to sleep, really not to sleep. We have to walk. We come from, we fled here, and we come from about civil war. And we are seeing dying every day. One day, three children are dying, three young boys are dying. Please and please, thank you, and thank you to come us and to talk us. We are really happy. Passionately and emotionally, actually, embody the feeling of lost mothers in, in the UK. Uh, yes, no, I, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with the sisters. We need to talk more so, not only when there's something bad happening, we should be talking also when we have something positive. But as you said, the police, you see the police when something bad happens, and when you call them to help you, you don't get the response, and that is not satisfactory, and that's something which should not be happening. Um, and, you know, I've always worked with you on other issues, you know, but this is very, very important to all of us in this room. But I know that it's something which worries you because, as you said, you don't know who's next, which mother is going to be crying, which mother is going to be burying their child, and that is not acceptable. And I know your journey, you know, I know how hard it's been for many of you to come here from a place which was full of conflict as well. Some people, you know, forget your history. You've come here for peace, you've come here for a better life for your children. And for this to be happening, it means that something's gone wrong. So we have to take that very seriously, and I'm with you all the way. And thank you so much for you know always listening to me and for working with me, because we've got a big task on our hands, but we can only do it together. 
And I'd like to thank the lady at the back who gave us some really good pointers about how the community must start supporting their own children and not just waiting on the system to come in and support them because as we can see at times it fails us and we need to all work together and I really want to take all your details because as I said in the new year I want to do a bigger conference and there's certain voices in this room already which I know need to be at that conference. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, Interaction, an organization that is, uh, heavily supports the local community organization is uh, Joe, would you like to? Yeah. Okay, um, so 10 years ago I ran a program um, for youth projects in Enfield. They were quite easy to find. They worked in partnership with youth centres and youth workers. We did some capacity building, so we did some strains, uh, training, um, and the projects took place. Then funding got harder. The young people naturally moved on with their own lives to university employment and with their own families. Today, there are notably less youth groups coming forward. The youth centres are empty and the youth workers have gone. I believe it's been cut from about 92 to 2 in the borough. There are, therefore, there are less channels for young people to be attracted to the voluntary sector. So at Enfield Voluntary Action, we want to re-engage young people through inspiring... Um, we want to engage young people through inspiring young people to get the knowledge, skills and resources so they can make a difference in their communities. In June, we created the Community Awards to celebrate the achievements of the voluntary sector. We included awards for young people in inspiration, innovation and inclusion because we wanted to recognise and support the efforts of young people. We invited Sharon Long from the Partnership for Young London to our AGM in October because the voluntary sector needs to be more proactive in this area. We all have a duty to young people. Sharon's message was clear. We need to create projects and activities for young people to attract young people to the voluntary sector. There has to be positive social local action but that will directly appeal to young people. In an ideal world, this will be created by young people for young people, but we're not in an ideal world and we all need to initiate this work because we can't carry on hoping that somebody else will fill this void creating the violence that we're all so disturbed by. The voluntary sector is having a really hard time, but we still have choices. So we can choose to create projects for young people. So arts groups, sports groups, even older people's groups with intergenerational projects, dancing, singing, singing women's groups. We all have that duty for young people. We will all benefit from young people being in our organisations who understand technology, social media, bringing a fresh approach. We will all benefit from safer streets and more cohesive society. Enfield Voluntary Action has helped hundreds of community groups and thousands of volunteers to take part in local social action, connecting people to opportunities. We ourselves have applied for three grants to help youth groups this year. We're waiting to hear back from two others. The Young Londoners Fund is one of those opportunities and later on I'll talk through some more um, uh, funding opportunities. We want to see our youth centres full. We want to see a menu of positive activities for young people across Enfield. And we want to see skilled youth workers in, in, in voluntary organisations. And we want to be able to, next year, we want to be able to celebrate more young people's contributions to the community. That's what we're really aiming for. EVA can do our best to guide you, inform you, empower you, and provide the access you need to get resources to set up your youth projects. But we can't do it, we can't do it without you. So I'm, I'm really putting a plea across to say, please, consider youth projects, come to EVA, our doors are open and we're ready to work with you if you have ideas for youth projects. This is really where we believe we can make a difference. Um, so I've got some, I've got some, um, Kishore, our community development worker, um, has, has found some trusts and foundations for young people's projects and we'll be happy to talk to any groups that want to apply and try and set up youth projects in the borough. As I say, the, the um, Young Londoners Fund from the, the London Mayor's Office 
is a very good one to uh, to start with. That's going to be there's going to be a new funding round opening in the new year. There's also the Paul Hamlin Foundation, Children in Need, um, Lady Allen of of um, Trust, Association of Play Industries, Tesco's Charity Trust. There's so many funders that will fund projects in this borough, um, and really the, the starting point may be with, with a lottery grant awards for all or culture seeds, which is very easy. You need 400 words to, to state what your project is. But we really, really want to um, appeal to you to say, come forward with your ideas because we want to help you make them a, a reality. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to come here today, but I'm really glad to have the opportunity to come and see you and talk to you about some of the work that we're doing. Um, we, as an organisation, are set up to fight racism and to promote equal opportunities and to build a cohesive borough. And I think it's very important that we consider how families can be supported within creating a community cohesive borough. Um, in the past, we've actually had conferences where um, intergenerational work has been asked for by the young people themselves. People assume that young people don't want to be around the older people, but actually they would like the opportunity to be in places where the older people are as well. For example, in mosques and temples, etc. But I think that some of those opportunities have been actually missed. We haven't actually been able to develop um, that with the communities. But I know that good work does go on in many places, but I think it is important to, to assist um, you know, our MP Kate when she's actually doing some work in the future of the conference, maybe raise those issues about working together and maybe working with families as well. Um, at the moment, we at the moment we don't actually have um, any funding for young people uh, in our work um, in, the, in the RSE. However, we are actually doing a project called Community uh, Communities United Against Hate Crime, and I know some people suffer from. Um, harassment, and it's, as you, you would have heard about the Syrian refugee uh, children who have been bullied and uh, harassed in schools. So, I mean, it would be important, I think, for me to give you some information about our project, which can actually support families and young people. And we will, we're trying to get volunteers to be part of a community's witness team to actually support people in hotspots where there is a lot of hate crime happening. And you know, I can leave some leaflets here, but also we've got an advocacy worker which will be only here part-time uh, because we share this work with many other RECs in East London. But uh, we do actually have some resources where individuals can go into, uh, our worker can go into the family home to support you to see what is actually happening in the neighborhood of your child you know, if they're suffering from racial harassment or bullying at school. So can you please, um, you know, take some of this information and, and use it. And also we have another project where we're helping refugees to get into sustainable employment. So if there are families or young people themselves who must have had a status as a refugee in the past, it doesn't have to be now, it could be that the, you know, there is somebody who's actually had that status but is now a British citizen even. Um, they, they may be able to seek um, uh, jobs, etc. We can help with CV writing and, and other opportunities for them with our partners from Renacy, which is a very um, well-known organisation that helps people with employment issues. So I can leave you those information, but moreover, I'd like you to know that we're actually based upstairs as actually neighbours of, of Enfield Bond Reaction. We're both based upstairs on the second floor uh, as organisations and we are there to help the community with any issues, particularly with dis discrimination, it, is, you know, if, if there is somebody facing employment issues or any other kind of discrimination, uh, then we are able to assist um, with, with, <coughs> with someone who can actually you know, take your views forward or your issues forward and get you to the right places to someone else who might be able to assist you. So, you know, we are there to help as individuals, we're there to help organisations. So, you know, in, in many ways we are, we are there for you. But I think sometimes our message and our name is not really known to you all. So, I mean, we, we are actually, you know, there for, for you. And if you've, got, you know, if you've got things you want to talk to us about, I'm sure that Bashir will also, you know, you know he's on our board actually, Bashir. Um, you know, he'll be able to assist you through to communicate with us as well. 
So thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'll leave some of these makers here for you. Paul Ridget to say the closing point is on board together the conference before we <coughs> go to lunch. Five. And I work as a storyteller. I collect people's stories. And as a result of that, I've met a number of Somali organizations. So I have a, a, a kind of specialism in Somali stories and in Somali experiences. And th this is how I know uh, poverty concern. And to some extent, Bashir as well. Um, but I'm also a, a taker of notes. I like to listen to people and write down what they say. So I'm going to type up all, all the things that people have said, which I've noted. I'll, I'll type all this up. And, and um, we can circulate it. So, ju ju but just to summarise the, the, the points that I pulled out of today, and this, this is just a summary for today, but because I'll, I'll give you the full notes later on. I've heard people talking about what would be called structural factors in, in um, uh, knife crime. And those factors are things like funding for the police, uh, poverty, um, the, the, the absence of facilities and of uh, youth programs. Um, and they're also about, oh, the mayor has come, the mayor has come, I have to stop. The mayor has come. <laughs> that was it, that was it. We had the citizenship ceremony this morning. Nearly 100 people got their British kind of certificates. And I had to kind of deal with all that. I'm so sorry to apologise. This is such an important kind of event for all of us in Edmonton, especially. Um, so, really, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Ah, oh, do, do, do you want to? Yeah. Shall, I, shall I continue? Or do, you, do you want to? I'll be quick. Shall I be quick? After, after the May. After, okay, after the May. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we, we want to have very important and fair points to be included in your sample. Ah, 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 good, good, good thinking. Good thinking yeah. okay. well, Edmonton is the most deprived and poorest area of Enfield anyway. And we're suffering from high rate of knife crime and uh, some elderly and also children, vulnerable people who live in Edmonton, some parts of Edmonton, they don't feel safe. So we need um, to get together and we need a um, strong uh, struggle really to fight back and get together and um, look for the solution. And we kind of um, working very closely with the local police um, for the safety security and um, everyone else. But the thing is, we need our communities to get together, as you did today, which is really, really valuable. So we need to get all together and look for the tactics and solution where we can guide these young adults into healthy lifestyle where they can keep themselves away from all this danger. Because it's like a little game for them. It's like a little... Um, toy for them, but it's not. We're constantly losing lives in Edmonton. Um, in the last few months, we um, we had many, many incidents where many mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters approached ourselves and council and uh, you know showed their concerns and worries. So it is worrying, and we should all worry about it and really um, get up and get together and stand against this. Whatever we can do, whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If there is any question for the uh, lady mayor, um, sorry, lady mayoress, yeah. Miss Elaine, the <laughs> uh, then we will move to um, closing down remarks from Bridget. Any? Uh, yeah. The mayor is again is a, is a, is a local councillor as well as the mayor of Enfield. She's a BME councillor with humble beginnings, and that gives her, puts her in a special place to understand the local issues and also, you know, um, um, to have priorities in her work for the issues that we may all uh, face. 
there's any issue, there's any question? Before you ask any questions, I have to kind of admit this. My role is non-political. It's completely impartial. Um, so I won't be able to answer any political questions because I'm kind of representing the whole borough at the moment. Um, and I have to be completely impartial and I will talk um, with love and peace. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're running a bit late, yeah. so if we can limit the uh, comments or questions, one minute each person. Sorry, man. And as we had before, and I think we we have to. We would like to get more places because let me tell you a little story has a big meaning. And like I have seven years old daughter, which is a lot of which she has um, more curiosity. So she would like to know everything or what's going on around the world. Like every night when I send her to bed, she watches through the window outside and she watches boys or men are drug dealing downstairs of my, out of my flat. So she came to me and said, Mommy, look, every time when I go to bed, I watch them. And I couldn't let her watch because I don't want her to see normal, what is not normal. She's only some years old and I have other children, so I don't want them to see what's going on outside my house is normal, which is not normal. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see more places or like more community service, yes, most community place. Thank you very much. Thank yes. You. And also the local police are just trying very hard um, to, for your daughter and for all the ch other children living in the field, for them to see something positive outside from their window. Thank you. And I was just going to ask, there's loads of stuff on there, but it's usually all about you know, paying your taxes or about housing or those other issues. So um, it would be great just to know for, for parents, for young people, um, in the cases even where maybe police aren't there to the outside of their estate, that there's somebody else that she can call. There's outreach teams that are able to just make a presence. Um, and it'd be really, I don't know if there's a way that that can be navigated. It probably would take a long time, but... If I don't know if you um, kind of when yeah. you look at the website, yeah. it's it will which part that you could, you can kind of I can come back to you with we can both understand exactly what parts. But we've got hundreds of kind people, very kind people, in voluntary sector organisations and in local uh, voluntary sector working very very hard to improve people's lives and to enhance people's lives in Enfield. Mm -hmm. So there is so many um, organisations where you, we could all get support from. Yeah, there's many, but we're just there's not many. connected. That's we just, I mean. yeah. Yeah. If I just yeah. um, say with this is on. Um, we, at Enfield Voluntary Action, we have um, 798 organisations in Enfield on our database. We want to make um, a very grassroots um, local directory. Um, we have submitted funding um, um, to, to secure that and to try and make that a reality. So we are working on that. We're, we're waiting for a decision whether that we've, whether we've got the funding for that. Um, if that's not successful, we have another one in the pipeline. We will make that a reality as soon as we get the funding. It's something we're working on. So, yeah, watch this space, hopefully. Thank you very much. We're running actually late, so I will call Richard to... Ah. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm even quicker than I was going to be. So, so just to summarise the, la the last two hours, there are, there are factors in um, cuts, less police, less facilities, less funding. Then there are factors in terms of identities, po positive identities and negative identities. Um, this, this can come from stigma, it can come from school exclusion, um, it can come from police perceptions of the public, public's perceptions of the police. These identities are swirling around. Then there's um, a layer to do with people's beliefs and people's attitudes. Uh, and then finally, there is 
there are all the locations which have to work together, schools, homes, youth clubs, community organisations, and employers. Employers haven't been touched on very much, only one mention of employers. Um, and maybe the last thing is that to go from being a child into being a youth into being an adult is a, a universal transformation which happens everywhere in all societies. And somehow what we're talking about today is that this has become incredibly troubled and difficult and that it raises incredibly powerful emotions and fears. And what this meeting seems to be about is somehow a gathering of people to ensure that this transition returns to how it has been in the past, a, a smooth transition, rather than the, the, the difficult transition that so many people have spoken about. So I'll, I'll, I'll type up all these notes, <laughs> and uh, so everybody's voice will hopefully be heard. My note-taking is very good. A, a lifetime of note-taking has, has meant that I'm quite accurate. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, again, before Mr. Isaac closes the conference, I would like to thank everybody who attended. Um, this was actually a pilot project by the Somali organizations in Enfield uh, for the local community, not only for the Somali community, but for everybody who lives in Enfield to make Enfield a safer place to live and to grow up. Uh, kids. Uh, we got the message from all of you and also from the political leaders, the local leaders, and um, you will see more of this hopefully um, as local community leaders, as parents, as residents in Anfield. We actually feel, we feel, you know, um, the the pain, the feelings, the wars that every one of you has talked uh, uh, talk about today, and uh, we'll be working harder. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, um, other organizations come from West London. Banoda Foundation is here, uh, Abdurrahman is uh, Dr. Onai, and Dr. Uh, is, uh, Pakistan, they are here. Trunji, uh, they came all uh, another Oporo. Thank you very much, any, uh, everybody. And uh, we are going to lunch now, uh, half lunch. Uh, is, uh, is, um, after lunch, I think uh, we can go home. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>